<laughs> well, tonight we're going to, as you can tell, our group is significantly smaller than normal. And we're not going to be doing our normal Bible study. We're going to let the people come back from next week to catch up, to resume what we're talking about here. But what I thought we'd do is to explore a timely topic. There's two verses in the Bible that I'd like to take a quick look at, and we're going to use this as our theme verse this evening, and see if this, these two verses can give us reasons why we should be very thankful for our faith. And you're going to know the first one right off the bat, but I'm going to give you the next verse, because this is the verse you usually don't hear about. When you go to the ball game and somebody holds up a sign in the stands, what, what verse are they going to quote? John 3, let's look up John 3, 16 and 17. And let's really dissect this verse, because I think this verse here really gives us the reason why we should be thankful for our faith. Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him may not die, but may have eternal life. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Okay, the famous John 3.16. We've heard it before, right? God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him. I want to contend to you, that's really the reason why we should be thankful for our faith. And you, many of you have seen this before in my class. If this is a representation of our faith, The foundation of our faith is built upon something. You know, we call ourselves Christians, right? What's the base word of the Christian? Christ. Christ. What is the absolute foundation of our faith? Christ. We need to know Christ. Who He was, what He did, and as a result of what He did, what He's offering each and every person. And this has a, a name. The absolute foundation of our faith that every Christian needs to understand and believe. What's that, that uh, name called? The gospel. Basic gospel message. Remember last week I was telling you about Deb and I went to Texas. We did an evangelization retreat. This is what we did. We proclaimed the gospel message, the essential component of our Christian faith. And this is what I believe that we should be very thankful for our, our faith on what that gospel message is all about. What I'd like to do is just kind of dissect that gospel message and look at some of the components and see the reasons why we have reason to give thanks for what's there. So let's take a quick look at it. You're all Bible scholars now, right? We're going to dig in the Bible and let's learn to learn about this message. Remember way back in the beginning of the Bible? I mean way back in the beginning. What is the very first thing that the Bible speaks about in the very first book? Creation. Creation. And what did God create? Everything. Okay, he created everything. Remember on the first and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth day? He's, he creates and creates and creates. And every time he's created something on the first through the fifth day, he says, it is good. Then on the sixth day, remember he creates the pigs along with the man, right? But what did God say on that sixth day when he created man? It is very good. Very good. And when we read the very first part of Genesis, what was Adam and Eve's relationship? with God in the very beginning. Perfect. What was the relationship? Perfect. perfect. What do you mean by perfect? They talked with God. They talked with God. They communicated with God. He walked with God. And where where does scripture say they lived? Paradise. In the paradise, the Garden of Eden. Eden. Telling us that these people lived in perfect harmony, perfect fellowship with God. How much better can that get, right? Why did God create everything? Did He have to create everything? Did He have to create man and woman? 
No. Why did he create everything? He loves us to glorify him. Let's just look at a couple verses in scripture here. How about the book of Isaiah? You've heard, you've heard this passage before. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 through 4. Let's learn why God created everything. But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. In the rivers, you shall not drown. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. The flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in return for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and glorious, and because I love you, I give man in return for you, and peoples in exchange for your life. I have called you by name. You are mine. Because you are precious in my eyes, and because I love you. And how about the New Testaments? Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what can separate us? Nothing from God's love. So the very first component... Well, the very foundation of our faith is God loves you. The very foundation. We have to understand this. God loves each and every one of us. How much does he love us? How much? Can't measure. Unconditionally, right? No matter what. The first component. How's that for get up, be given thanks? Just for that one component by itself. God loves us. But then did everything go hunky-dory? Did they live happily ever after, Adam and Eve? What did they do? How long did it take them to sin? Fifteen minutes. <laughs> According to the Bible, three chapters. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created, and they lived, they were living in perfect fellowship with God, and right there in chapter 3, they blew it. They blew it. And what did they blow? How did they blow it? They rebelled against God. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed. They disobeyed God. They became their own God. Did they have a little help in the process? Or were they kind of nudged a little bit in the process? Who nudged? Satan. 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 Initially he told with Eve, you know, don't believe what God says. And they used their free will to disobey God. And as a result of Adam and Eve sinning, what happened to them? <laughs> they got separated from God and God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. And they went, remember, east? Remember in our study, we're reading the Old Testament. Every time somebody goes east of Eden, what is that representing? Going away from God. So they were separated from God. And there's you know, lots of verses in Scripture about this one here. How about, just let's look at one. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. What kind of death is Paul talking about here? What kind of death did Adam and Eve experience? Did God just go, they're dead, struck them dead? Spiritual death. They suffered a spiritual death. And what is spiritual death? They're separated from God. Separated from God. That's the spiritual death. So we had some wonderful news. God loves each, each and every one of us. But due to Adam and Eve and them sinning, what does now sin do? Who? 
sin now separates us from God. That's bad news. But, was God going to give us another chance? According to Vic, the most important verse in the entire Bible is Genesis, 3, Genesis chapter 3, 3 verse 15. What does it say in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? God is speaking God is speaking directly to Satan. And what did God tell Satan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head, and you will strike at the heel. What did God just do on that one little verse? Promised the Redeemer. He promised a solution to the problem. He promised the solution to this. And what was the solution? Christ. In the future, there's going to be a woman, and she's going to have a male offspring, and this offspring is going to strike the head of Satan. What does striking the head imply? Killing. 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 Or destroying the consequences of that sin. And then we know, you know, what happens. You know, Jesus died for our sins, right? He came and he died for our sins. So the third component, we have good news now. Right? We celebrate it every Easter. That's why we celebrate it. So Christ now died for my sins. As a result now of Christ dying for our sins, what does now God offer every single human being on planet Earth? Salvation. Salvation. How much does it cost? Free gift. It's free. Can we work our way to get it? Can we buy it? Can we earn it? No, no, no. It's a free gift. It's totally a free gift. That's some very good news. Now God stands with his arms open. The free gift of salvation is yours. Now, just because a person is born, does that person automatically now get the free gift of salvation? What do you mean? It's a free gift. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You can't work your way to get it. You can't buy it. You have to accept it. Ah. Just like a gift. I can stand up here all day long with a free gift. But unless you take that gift, right, and accept it, what good is that gift? Of no good. Of no use. You know, Scripture tells us that what we have to, what do we have to do in order to accept this free gift of salvation? Let's just read some of these verses. You've heard them before. First of all, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, whoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. Belief. How about Acts chapter 2 verse 21? What do we have to do in order to accept the free gift of salvation? John 3.16 says believe. Acts chapter 2 verse 21. And it shall be that everyone shall be saved who calls on the name. You'll be saved if you call upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. So what is Scripture telling us that we have to do? We have to accept the free gift of salvation. 
And then there's a word that goes with it. We have to undergo conversion. conversion. What does conversion mean? Obeying. Well, no. I have to say yes. You're saying yes to Christ. Yes, I believe. Yes, I'm confessing you with my mouth. It's doing something. Do you realize in order to accept that free gift of salvation, you've got to do something? You've got to say yes to God. But is conversion more than just saying yes to God? Is it just accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and then going on watching football and going hunting and totally neglecting God the rest of your life? What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I did it. Okay, I accepted it. Wonderful. Now let me go and have fun. What does it mean to say you have belief? You have to dedicate your life to Him. Okay, dedicate your life to Him. And what do you have to do? When you dedicate your life, obey his, obey his command. You might have heard this example before about a tightrope walker. Famous tightrope walker. There's a promoter who wanted him to come. He's in Europe. And he says, Tightrope walker, could you come? And I'm, we're going to stretch a line between Canada and the United States over the Niagara Falls. So the tightrope walker came and said, sure, I can do this. So huge crowds came on the Canada side, on the American side. The tightrope walker came. He starts on the United States side. He starts going across the tightrope. And he goes across partway, the wind starts to blow. And he has a heck of a time getting across, but finally when he gets over the Canada side, he made it. The crowd goes wild. He tells the crowd on the Canada side, do you believe that I can go back on the tightrope? Across the United States side, blindfolded. The cheer goes wild. The crowd goes wild. Yes, we believe you can do it. So he puts on the blindfold. And he goes back across that tightrope to the United States side. And the wind's getting blowing harder and harder. And he struggles and struggles. And after hours, he finally makes it to the United States side. The crowd goes wild. And then he goes to the crowd on the United States side. Do you believe that I can go back on that tightrope? Blindfolded and pushing a wheelbarrow. The crowd goes wild. Yes, we believe you can do it. And he asked, could I have a volunteer? That's what faith is all about. You can say all you want you believe in that tightrope walker, but if you did not get into that wheelbarrow, do you really believe? Not really. That's what Jesus is telling us that we have to do in order to say yes to him. It's really getting into the wheelbarrow. And what we like to call it, it's having faith and don't you need both to really be a follower? And that's what conversion is all about. And this is the foundation, folks, of our faith. Nothing is more basic than this message. You have to believe this in order to be a Christian. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We have to believe this. And this is the foundation of our faith. And this is the same message that's been taught for 2,000 years. And you know, what is the history book of the Bible? In the New Testament, there's one book in there that is a history book. Amen. Acts of the Apostles, right? When we read Acts of the Apostles, we learn how those apostles went out and spread the good news of Christ. Did they go out and explain how many sacraments they are, what's the different types of sin, what are holy days of obligations, da 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 da? What did they go out and teach? This is what those apostles taught. Remember Christ commanded those apostles to go out and teach? This is what they taught to non-Christians. 
You've got to start with the foundation, the absolute basics of the faith. That's what they taught. So let's go back and read John 3, 16 and 17 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You look at those verses... Now let's see if the gospel message is included in those verses. For God so loved the world. He gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. <laughs> For God does not send His world, Son into the world to condemn, but the world might be saved through Him. Isn't that incredible news? Isn't that reason, a wonderful reason, to be thankful for our faith right there? In the absolute foundation of our faith? I just wanted to kind of bring us up, because sometimes we just take it for granted, the absolute basics. But you know what? Those absolute basics are the greatest need to give thanks for our faith, because it's all there. There's nothing more important than that. <laughs> so what do we have to be thankful for? The absolute foundation of our faith. Call the gospel message. But now I can ask a question. Is that all there is now to know? Is that all there is to our faith? To having faith and knowing our faith? Is just knowing this? We have to grow in our faith. Okay, we have to grow in our faith. As I showed you, this is a kind of a sketch of our, of our faith. And the absolute foundation is knowing Christ. But then the question I ask, is that all there is to it? Well, let's see what the Bible says as far as understanding our faith. Let's take a look at some passages that might give us some more insight on understanding our faith. You ready? We've got a lot of passages to look at. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Brothers, the trouble was that I could not talk to you as a spiritual man, but only as men of flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and did not give you solid food because you were not ready for it. You are not ready for it even now. Okay, Paul talking to this group of people in Corinth. And he says they're infants in Christ. I like to call them baby Christians. They're some baby Christians. And what did Paul say he fed those baby Christians? Milk. Milk. How many of us are parents here? What do you feed your very young infant when they're first born? Milk. Why? What do you say, Amber? What? Why, why do you feed a baby milk? They're not ready for solid. They're not ready for anything else. That's the only thing they can take, right? So that's what the, the, the basic food that a baby gets is milk. And that baby grows from that milk. Paul's making the same analogy here to baby Christians. He says... I'm going to give you the milk of our faith. And remember we talked about those apostles going out and spreading the good news? What did they initially spread? The very basics. Or the milk. I like to call this the milk of our faith. There's nothing more basic than this in our life as a Christian. So as a baby Christian, we need to be fed the milk. That's what the milk is. The absolute basics. Of the faith. Let's go to First Peter chapter two, verse two. Be as eager for milk as newborn babies, pure milk of the spirit to make you grow unto salvation. There goes this theme about milk again. Peter's talking about milk, and he's here like newborn infants long for that spiritual milk. See what Peter calling this spiritual milk? 
What do you think he's referring to? The very basics of the faith. For baby Christians, you get fed milk. But then after a point in time, as all you parents know, the baby grows up, right? And then things change. Well, you think he, do you think the Bible talks about this? Probably does. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, 13 and 14. Hebrews chapter 5, 13 and 14, and, verse, and chapter 6, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 5, 13 and 14. Everyone who lives on milk lies Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us leave behind the basic teaching about Christ and advance to maturity without laying the foundation all over again. Repentance from dead works and faith in God. What does it say here? Everyone who lives on milk lacks experience of the world, for he is a child. Now the author of Hebrews says, if you live on milk all of your life, you're going to be a child all your life. So what is the author saying? But solid food is for the mature. Then it goes to verse 1 in chapter 6. Therefore, let us leave behind the basic teaching about Christ and advance to maturity. What is the author of Hebrews saying here? Grow up. Don't be a spiritual baby all of your life. Grow up. Grow up in your faith. And that's what we're commanded to do as Christians. We're not supposed to be a baby Christian all of our lives. And kind of put it into the analogy. This is the milk of our faith. But we're commanded to grow up in our faith. So our faith consists more of just knowing about the milk part. We need to know about the solid food. And that leads us now to the next component in our pyramid about knowing our faith. We need to know Christ, but we need to know another component here. So let's see what the scripture tells us. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And he put all things beneath his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Who wrote Ephesians? Okay, we got Paul again. What was he telling us here? Gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body. Who's this referencing? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus now. The church, which is his body. So Paul's telling us, he's making an analogy here. The church, the body of Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, 23 and 24. For the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church, he himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Could you read that last couple words again? No, I'm just kidding. Subordinate <laughs> to their husbands in everything. Christ is head of the church, right? And it says the church is subordinate to Christ. And then drop down a couple of verses, 31 and 32. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One more verse. This is a great mystery. But I speak in reference to Christ and the church. Okay, we've gone to weddings before, right? Yes. The two shall become one, right? The covenantal relationship of marriage. The two shall become one. But what does Paul say right in the next verse? This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and his church. The two shall become one. Another great example. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus? This anti-Christian. He was knocked off his horse, right, by a blinding light. 
And a voice comes down. And remember that voice told Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 4? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me. Wait a minute. Christ was ascended to heaven. He was gone. Who was Paul persecuting? Christians. Paul was persecuting these Christians, these followers of Christ. Christ was ascended into heaven. But you notice what Christ said? Why are you persecuting me? What is the analogy that we're getting here? Christ and his church are one. So what I like to do on top of this part of it here, we have to learn about Christ first, the foundation of our church. But Scripture tells us explicitly, explicitly, Christ and His church are one. You know, our catechism says Christ and His church thus make up the whole Christ. In order to fully know Christ, you've got to know His church. In order to know the church, you've got to fully know know Christ. And I think this is the complete component of our faith. This is what we have to understand in order to get a complete understanding of our complete faith. I want to present to you something. You know I'm in a master's program in theology and I had to write a paper. My last course I was taking was the theology of the church and I came up with something here and I just wanted to pass it on to you. To kind of show the analogy, I wanted to go through a, a logical process. Did anyone ever use logic or study logic? You ever do this? Remember that? A equals B. Maybe we should go B equals C. Therefore, anyone ever see that before? Standard logic formula, right? What I'd like to do is let's use scripture and this logic formula, and I'd just like to develop something for you very quickly. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but here goes. Quick looking up Bible verses. John chapter 1, verse 17. Because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Christ. Christ equals truth. Okay? You know, there's other passages in there say, you know, Scripture, John's Gospel says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Scripture tells us, equates Jesus with truth. Something that we just looked at earlier. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Christ and his church are one. Christ and his church are one. So using this formula, what does it tell? What, what, is, what can we take this to A equals C? I bet you didn't know you're getting into a math course tonight. What, what can we logically deduce? If Christ is truth, Christ and his church are one. You think there's a scripture passage that can support us? Let's look up 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. But if I should be delayed, you should know how to behave in the household of God, which is the truth of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Scripture tells us what's the pillar and foundation of truth, and it calls it the church. So that's why. we look at our faith life, let's know Christ, have a personal relationship with Him, accept the free gift that He's given us. But in order to get the fullness of our faith, we also have to know His church. This is what He established. He ascended into heaven. He's going to leave us. But He says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. 
I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to guide us. And he established a church to help us in our journey in knowing the truth. So both components are essential in our faith. So just in summary, as I'm fighting the clock here, let us be thankful for our faith. Let us be thankful first for what Christ did for us and dying for us, giving us the free gift of salvation. And also let's be thankful for the way in which Christ allowed his truth to be maintained for centuries and centuries. I've got one minute here. Let me just make one more point. When we talked about there's remember, whenever we talk about salvation, you know, a lot of times we lump salvation into one thing. We always say salvation, salvation, salvation. Remember, there are three words that we should know whenever we come to the concept of salvation because it breaks down salvation into the components, the logical components. Do you remember what those words are? What did Christ do on the cross for us? Redemption. He redeemed us. Redemption. The first word we should know. And this is what? Christ did by dying on the cross and rising. That's redemption. This is what Christ did. Then we have salvation. salvation. What's salvation? Reuniting with God. Okay. It's that free gift of heaven or being united with God. Redemption was what Christ did. As a result of redemption, we have salvation, or that free gift. And the last word is called justification. And what's that? How you accept that free gift. Whenever you hear the word salvation, if you break it down into these components, you can understand exactly what we're talking about. A lot of people just call everything salvation. And it gets a little confusing. Break it down in your mind. Redemption, what Christ did. Salvation is that free gift. Justification, what do I have to do to accept that free gift? And remember, we talked about conversion. 